Hey y'all, so welcome back. I know you haven't seen the C Diggy Talks in a long time, but yes, this is C Diggy Talks where I bring on a guest where I can talk about whatever the hell I want to. And today's episode, I figured it was really important and I want to talk about the vaccine and trusting the vaccine while black and why are black people so reluctant to take the vaccine. So I brought on um, my returning guest, uh, one of my best friends and podcast creator of In Those Genes, uh, Dr. Janina Jeff. So welcome. <laughs> Hi. I say good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Uh, in I like your shirt. Yeah, of course. I had to rep the In Those Genes team. If y'all didn't know, I'm like the creative director as well. So who better to bring aboard this topic than a Black woman who works in the intersection of science? So with that said, can you please let them know like your credentials and just your research background, et cetera? Yes. So my name is Dr. Jeff. I am a human geneticist, population geneticist by training. What that means is I study the genome, which is the DNA that make up who we are. And the genome is really a book of instructions that tell our body what to do, how to respond, how we look, all these beautiful things that make us us. And I like to study these things at a population level. And so we know race doesn't exist. I look at people who share common ancestors. And so I look at differences between people who share common ancestors. And I work for a company that studies, you know, the DNA and genomes at large. Uh, I am a genetic epidemiologist, which means that I do study populations. I do understand how disease and how mutations travel through populations. And when COVID first happened, um, the company that I work for and a lot of genetic technology was being created to discover what the virus was. And so the virus was originally identified through genetics and we traced the virus and understand the many different forms and different types of subtypes of the virus using genetics as well. Yeah, so I was inspired with this topic because I mean, First and foremost, the obvious, like um, in those genes, the podcast has had, you know, an episode called Trusting Vaccines While Black. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know your stuff and you've done the research on it. And my second inspiration was when I went home for Thanksgiving in Houston, I was talking to my family about the vaccine. I was wondering who would take the vaccine because, you know, I have a lot of elders in my family where they're in their 60s, going on 70s. And I wanted to know, like, will they take the vaccine when it's available to them? And to my surprise, only my uncle, who's like, um, I'm guessing late 60s, mm -hmm. and myself were the only ones who said they would actually take the vaccine. Mm. And, you know, it was a lot of distrust. They are just like, oh, no, I'm going to wait till somebody take it first. I, I don't know what that is, you know? I feel like not only is there mistrust, but there's a lot of, like, misinformation going out, too. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I brought you on is just because I want us to talk facts, you know, mm -hmm. and break down these like these misinterpretations of what's coming at us. I mean, I think the biggest thing is two things. So one, people's hesitation to take in the vaccine is a very real thing. And it is not shaped necessarily by a lack of education. Um, it's shaped by actual experiences. It's shaped by a medical system that has failed us, that has disproportionately made us the victims of COVID-19, as well as the victims of a whole bunch of other racial shit that we deal with. So I want to make sure that when people are reluctant to take the vaccine, that we hold space to acknowledge that there's great reason for them to be not trusting of the science community and not trusting of the medical community. And that's because of a lot of the bad things that have happened in the past. Um, people like to talk about Tuskegee, but Tuskegee is not really the same here. Um, things that we should be talking about are things like yellow fever, where it was a myth that black people thought to be immune to it, caused black people to get it and die from it. Um, that is a much bigger correlation to the things that we're dealing with now versus the Tuskegee experiment. Um, here, what we're talking about, so the Tuskegee experiment, a lot of people believe, or, or it's a misinformation that they gave black men syphilis. That's not what happened. Um, the Tuskegee experiment was black men who already had syphilis thought they were being treated for syphilis and they were not being treated. 
Now, the reason why I think that that is kind of important in understanding what's happening right now with the virus and the vaccine is that in that case, they told people that they were giving them an intervention and they weren't. And Black people suffered and died because of it. And it was, they didn't know it and it was no transparency. They didn't know anything about it. That's different. With yellow fever, that was misinformation. That was saying that we were immune to it. Let's expose a bunch of black people to yellow fever and see if they die. And you know, that's completely different. And so there are a lot of instances. Um, you also have the obstetrician gynecologist who would perform, perform um, surgical procedures on black women because he assumed that they didn't experience pain. Um, you have Henrietta Lacks who cells were taken without her consent, nor was she treated for her, her cervical cancer. And so there are, plenty, there are plenty past and present experiences of a Black person in the medical system that account for the reason why we don't trust. And one of the biggest things around that is the lack of transparency, the lack of research that's being done that we don't know about and no communication to the Black community. And so one of the things that we like you know, we are passionate about at the podcast is making sure that we take the information that is out there and we make sure that everyone understands it. We make sure that everyone has access to it because access has been the biggest barrier um, in understanding, you know, what's really happening, asking the right questions, making sure that we dot our I's and cross all our T's and hold people in the medical system accountable. And so the trust, lack of trust is a very real thing. But right now we have a unique opportunity to understand the research that's happening because of all the bad shit that's happened in the past and because of the way that the healthcare is set up in the America in America there is a lot being done to make sure that our understanding of the virus is transparent and that all of the information is out there and so people like myself and other friends are taking that information translating it to the lay community so that we all have an understanding so when people say they don't trust the vaccine that's a real thing. And it's shaped sure. by all the things that I just talked about. Now let's peel another layer. And here's my biggest question. Mm. Well, if I give you all the information and I tell you how the vaccine works and I, you ask me a question, well, can the vaccine be purposely created to hurt a black person? And in that episode, we talk about why that's not possible. Um, could it be could it be designed to hurt any specific type of person? Why that's not possible? What are some of the things that are possible? And I really want everyone to start asking those questions. And we're seeing that come out now as more and more people get vaccinated. What are the things that we need to be concerned about? I think people also need to take all of the media that's coming out about the one person who developed this or the one person who developed that. You have to put into perspective, this is one, five, 10 people out of millions of people. There is always going to be a rare chance that something is going to happen. It is rare, unlikely to happen, but you know what's not rare? The virus. You know what's not rare? Dying from the virus. And so those two things are not rare. You having an adverse side effect to the vaccine is rare. And there's complications from other vaccines, correct? Yes. Right. Uh, can you, which vaccines are you referring to? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, that like the, um, the current vaccine has like a 95% effective rate as opposed to the flu vaccine, which is like 50% effective rate. So when you put that into context, then I feel like the vaccine can't be that bad to take. Yes. So here's the thing. Um, there are different types of vaccines. So right. the flu vaccine is actually exposing you to an attenuated version of the virus itself. And you are developing immunity because you've been exposed at a level that doesn't cause you to get sick, but some people do get sick. Um, there's different types of vaccine. The vaccines that have been approved by the FDA for the virus are mRNA vaccines. And so thing that is really important for people to understand is that this is not something that stays in your system. You know, really, it's just sending a message. It's just like hitting you up with like a Snapchat message that says, this is what the virus looked like. If you ever see this nigga, make I, sure that you kill him, okay? I and, love that analogy. I really love that Snapchat analogy. And so the, the real cool thing about it, right, just like Snapchat messages, they disappear. So it's like quick, fast, in a hurry. This is what the virus looks like. And then it's gone, right? And so the memory is there, 
the actual substance that was used and inserted into your body is no longer there. It clears the system within hours. Okay. So this is not something that's going to be, you know, there doing its own thing. It's not because it is an mRNA vaccine. It's not changing your DNA at all. In fact, it's not even touching your DNA. Nothing about it is altering any parts of who you are. Do people have adverse and side effects and or allergic reactions? Yes. And in fact, when you go to get the vaccine, they monitor you for about 15 to 20 minutes to make sure that you don't have a reaction to the vaccine, uh, an allergic reaction to the vaccine. So that is very possible. But when we start to talk about, when we say things like, um, it's going to change my DNA and, oh, I'm going to develop this and I'm going to develop that, you know, rare, rare, rare cases develop some allergic have an allergic reaction to the virus mm -hmm. um there has not been any long-standing evidence that something substantial can happen and in fact we don't believe that something like that will happen mostly because of how fast the virus clears from your body remember snapchat message this what that nigga look like poof gone bye right like I, t I tell people all the time it's like i don't know if you've ever been on instagram and you see like your friend's boyfriend or like their child or their best friend, somebody who they're always with. You constantly see pictures of them, but you've never met them before, but you know what they look like. So by the time you meet them, you're like, mm, I know what you, I mean, like you kind of like, I'm familiar with you. I know what you look like. It's, it's similar to that. And we all do that, right? Like, I can't tell you how many people I see on social media have never met. And then I'm like, oh, you know, feels familiar. So before we jump too far ahead, like you are on a roll right now. Like I don't even, <laughs> you, need, yeah, you just need your own show, which you do. <laughs> so um, I'm glad you like, cause at first I wanted to touch on the history of trust between black people in science. I think you, we covered that really well. Now I want to touch on like, what is in the vaccine? Mm -hmm. So one thing that was a misconception before is luciferase, right? <laughs> People were like, oh my God, uh, what's her name? Letitia James was like, there's luciferase and luciferase is from Lucifer and that's the devil and blah, 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 blah. Like, no. James from Black Panther from anyone who doesn't know. <laughs> Yes. So um, that is not in the vaccine. Um, the vaccine contains a, a bunch of agents that obviously preserve, um, but really what's in it is this mRNA and the other parts, of, the other things or substances that we need to make sure that the mRNA goes to the right place. And the right place is t telling, t going into your cells and showing your cells and giving your cells um, the picture and creating the memory of what the virus looks like. And so that's what that is. It's not DNA, it's mRNA. So the, to understand what that is, right? We have DNA, DNA makes up everything that we are. It makes up our entire, you know, genome. And then DNA is converted into something we call RNA. And then RNA is converted into something we call protein. So what we're doing is we're feeding your body the mRNA of the spike protein so we've all seen corona and it has a little the weird little spikes coming out of it um we're basically showing your body how to recognize that spike protein so we're giving it mrna and this mrna is now producing proteins that'll be able to help the body recognize that spike protein therefore they will create something that we call antibodies and these antibodies when it sees that you know that snapchat picture these antibodies are like a created armed force that say hey you can't come up in here acting all crazy no you can't use our cells no you can't stay here you are not welcome and you gotta go and so the antibodies are like your security system right and so the vaccine is just telling your security system to look for this dude who's trying to come up here and cause all these problems have you talked to people that were in the trials or have you um, talked to people who've taken the vaccine? Yes. So I've heard a couple of experiences of people who take the vaccine. It's so interesting because um, last night we decided that this week we're going to host an Instagram live and talk specifically to people who've already gotten the vaccine. Right. Um, I've heard mostly good things. No one I know has gotten sick. I've heard one person said that they've had a headache right after. And then I do know one person who had more of a severe reaction, even the person who had a more severe reaction, it persisted for a couple of hours and then it subsided. And, and so this is all these are black people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we're going to have them on Thursday for our Instagram live. But the biggest side effect of the vaccine that has been reported is soreness in the arm. 
And if you've ever gotten a vaccine, if you've ever gotten a shot, you yeah. should be used to that. <laughs> And I mean, you know, just to go back to this level of discomfort, we've all gotten COVID tests. That shit was not comfortable. And so, but it, it comes and it goes, right? You don't even remember that pain after a couple of minutes. And so there has been reports of people having, you know, severe soreness in the arm. Um, but these are typical things that you hear from vaccines. Uh, so, yeah. And I wanted to go over like the top reasons people give me about why they don't want to take it. So first, the one I hear all the time is, it came out way too fast. Why did it come out so fast? So that one is interesting because I like that question because it's like, it shows how dope genetics is because genetics is so dope. Okay, why is it so fast? So we as humans are 99.9% .9 the same, right? We share so much of our DNA with each other. We're actually more far related than we are not. Um, viruses are similar. And so the name of this virus, uh, the scientific name of this virus is SARS-CoV-2. That means that there was a SARS-CoV-1, or as we just call it, SARS-CoV. And the two was created because it's so closely related to the original SARS that it's not that different that it would, like, we would call it a new thing. The, the symptoms are the same. You know, a lot of the entryway points look very similar. There are just a few mutations that make SARS-CoV different from SARS-CoV-2. Now, why is that important? It's important is because scientists, immunologists have been already making vaccines for the original SARS a couple years ago when it happened. Now, that research wasn't funded, so this is political, right? The research wasn't funded, so they didn't continue the work on the vaccine, but what they did do was sequence the genome of the vaccine. That means that they understood every single bite that makes up SARS-CoV. So when SARS-CoV-2 came and we as geneticists broke it down and looked at the DNA of SARS-CoV-2, every single letter that makes up the virus and what it is, we said, oh my God, this is so close to SARS-CoV. Why don't we take all the work that we had already been doing for years on the original SARS and just change a couple of things so that it works for SARS-CoV-2. So if we were to think about that work plus this work, we're still talking about years of research. We're just happened to, this happened at the end where a lot of the hard, heavy lifting had been done already. Okay. There were also other things that, th that happened this year that are unusual to the way we make vaccines. So we have different phases of clinical trials, like phase one, two, three, and four. And typically they go in a sequential order where you have phase one, then you have phase two, then you have phase three. To speed things up, this time we did phase one and phase two at the same time. So a lot of these things were happening at the same time to make it quicker. I'm guessing as far as like time is concerned, someone I know with a, with a large platform, probably larger than mine, they were comparing it to like the iPhone release to where it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna wait till like the 11 comes out. I don't want this version because I want to make sure that it's okay for me. I'm just like, oh my God. And then I've heard mm -hmm. people say that there's like nanobites in it to control, like for mind control. Like I've just been hearing so many things. <laughs> so the thing I tell people all the time, it, before you say in a conclusion like that, make sure you understand how it works. Just like when people were saying they're going to create the virus to kill, har harm black people. Okay, if you're going to make that hypothesis, describe how that would look. How would it look? How could it actually happen? Do you understand how that would work? If you understand how that would work and you can put together the pieces to make that fit this narrative, then fine, we can talk about it. But outside of that, don't get into your headspace and your fantasies and start creating these things where we don't actually, you don't understand how that is even possible. So that's what I charge people to do. Understand how it's possible. And let's talk about the things that are possible. Let's talk about the things that could happen, right? That obviously is not happening and can't happen. People have to understand, they're like, oh, I wanna wait until a couple of people have taken it first before I take it. The phase two and three clinical trials included thousands of people, like 40,000 people from across the world. These are black people, these are white people, these are indigenous people, these are Latinx people, these are Asian people. It is, these are people who've had the virus, these are people who have not had the virus. Um, the only exception is it did not include kids, and I don't think it included pregnant women and very, very old people. But outside of that, the demographics of the people, most of us healthy people, were included in the trial. So thousands of people have already taken it. And right. the reason why we have the number 95% accuracy 
It's because they take it and they didn't get COVID, right? So we actually know that it works well. That's why we're doing it. Um, another thing I want to tell people is that if you want to know all the intimate details of all the steps that went into making the virus and all the data, make sure you watch these FDA trials. When they get FDA approval, they have to present this data. They have to show every sample that they gave the virus to and report all the data that came from it. It is not a secretive process here in the U.S. In fact, we have more access to this vaccine than we have ever had at, at a scale that's so publicly available. Um, another thing you had mentioned earlier was about the flu vaccine and it being, you know, 50 50 percent um, accurate. And, you know, there are different types of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the, the two that have been approved by the FDA are coincidentally both mRNA vaccines, but there are other va vaccines that are not mRNA vaccines that do not have as high accuracy. If you don't want to take those vaccines, you cannot take those vaccines, but they're going to run out. And when they run out, you're going to be left with other types of vaccines. And some of those vaccines might be a live version of SARS-CoV-2. And it might have the accuracy of 50 to 60 percent versus the 90 to 95 percent you get with the mRNA vaccines. And so when people are like, I want to see, I want to wait it out, you can wait it out if you want to, you're going to be waiting and not have a vaccine. And also let's think about the side effects of not being vaccinated. You're not going to be able to go nowhere. You may not be able to go to work. You may not be able to send your kids to school. You know, not being vaccinated is a big deal and it comes with consequences. People keep saying, I want to wait until other people take the vaccine. I want to wait until more people take the vaccine. I'm like, all right, let's sit about, think about all the people that have taken the vaccine. Rich people have taken the vaccine. Poor people have taken the vaccine. Old people, young people, sick people, not sick people, black people, non-black people, different types of black people, Afro-Caribbean, African on the continent, African-American, you know, all of these people have already taken the vaccine, guys. That's not an argument anymore. You've, mm. you've already, that period is over. Now we're talking about, you know, a lot, like we're in the millions now of people who have been vaccinated and so we're getting we're getting there but um i was wondering what do you say to people that say like oh well how come there isn't like you know an hiv vaccine or something like a cure for cancer you know like people are really like comparing it to those and i was like i didn't really know what to say if they got the vaccine this quick then how come they can't have cures for hiv or cancer so I think one thing, first of all, we're not going to sit up here and act like there has not been a lot of improvement in research for cancer, a lot of improvement in research for HIV. Um, so two things to delineate here. One is that HIV is a virus, right? So we can talk about that. But cancer is a disease, which is different than a virus. And a cure for cancer, cancer is a disease that has many different subtypes, Cancer is an extremely complicated uh, disease, right? We talk about different types of cancer. Cancer be can be caused by external factors. Cancer can be hereditary. Cancer is much more complex. But to say that we don't have cures and to say that things have not made progress in the research of these two fields is just not true. When we look at the number of people who have HIV in 2020 in the developed world, um, is actually very much so controlled. I mean, compared to the 80s, compared to when we didn't know things about this. So HIV research has been around for a long time. What has been one of the, one of the reasons, and I can connect you with someone who actually studies HIV um, full time, but one of the things that we have to also de delineate is what we're calling a cure, right? So a vaccine is not a cure. A vaccine is to prevent you from getting sick. You still develop, you still come in contact with the virus. What we're trying to control is the spread of the virus, right? So the vaccine is helping us, helping us control the spread of the virus and preventing people from giving it to other people and also preventing you from getting sick, which is different than giving you something to help you after you've already become sick from the virus. So for example, there are people who live with HIV, right? Now we have a bunch of interventions. It doesn't get rid of the virus, but what it is doing is helping mitigate some of the side effects and symptoms of the virus. There has been a lot of work in HIV and I don't wanna misspeak on uh, the work that's being done, 
but we can just look at the numbers alone and you can see that there's huge improvements that have been made about controlling the spread of HIV as well as people living with HIV and not developing AIDS, right? And so there has been a lot of improvement there. And it's also been a lot of improvement with cancer. And I think one thing we have to also remember, let's talk about the time in which these things happen. HIV was something that a lot of millions of people got over several years. SARS-CoV-2 and the virus is something that millions of people, millions of people got in the matter of months, right? And so the way in which it can be, uh, the way in which the virus can be transmitted to other people is completely different, right? Um, so there are a lot of big differences that make this virus more of a commonplace and, than other things. Now, what it does do, and to kind of to kind of answer that question in a different way, um, one thing that we do see is because of how popular SARS-CoV-2 is and because of the fact that it affected so many so quickly, we do see an extra push in research like we've never seen before. And that is something that highlights how common the virus is, but it also highlights how urgent it is and how it plays upon different roles in our society. So another thing is like, let's think about politics. Let's think about capitalism. You know, these are severely impacting everyone's life and there has been an urgent pull to get rid of them in a way that we haven't seen before, in a way that is not equal to, you know, the research that should be given to other diseases and things because they're not affecting us as much. So I'm not going to say that there isn't an inequity there. There is an inequity there. But I will also say that there's a lot of differences between cancer and HIV that make it a little bit more complicated and unique compared to SARS-CoV-2. Well said. <laughs> I, like, like, I could not say all that to somebody. Then I was like, okay, where's my doctorate at this point? <laughs> um, so moving on. Um, I hear there's like a new strain. What are we gonna do now that there's like this new strain? Like, is the vaccine still gonna protect me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. When we think about new mutations that arise from a genetic standpoint, we have to remember that majority of mutations in any organism to any other organism exists, right? I say 99.9% .9 of humans are the same, but that 0.1%, very, 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 very small percent makes us different but we still do a lot of the same shit, right? We still are humans. The virus is the same way, but even less, right? So we're talking about 99.9%. .9%. When we see this one mutation, that's like 99.9999999, you know, like it's a very, very, very small piece. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that we need to make sure that the new mutations that are arising are not affecting that spike protein that we talk about because the spike protein is what, that, that spike on the coronavirus is what binds to our cells to get into our bodies, right? The vaccine is designed for that spike protein. Any new mutation that arises, we need to make sure that it doesn't affect the structure of that spike protein. It could affect the inside on the left side of the little dot here and the little dot there, and it's not gonna make a difference. But as long as it doesn't start to affect that spike protein and that becomes different, then that's when we have a problem. So far, we have not seen any evidence that shows that the new mutations are affecting the spike protein in a way that the vaccine would not work. There is some evidence that there is, are some differences, but none of them have been shown from, and, and also the companies that are developing the vaccine are looking at the new, are uh, looking at the new mutations. We are all looking at the new mutations to try and understand how big of a difference it is. And one thing that we have seen is that the new mutation, and there are a couple, the new mutation also, there always have been mutations of COVID-19. I just want to say that. The reason why this one is getting so much press, the one that happened in Europe, is because of the fact that this particular strain we are seeing and we're seeing pat transmit faster, right? We're seeing a lot more people get sick faster than we did with the original versions of it. But there are always little mutations and we use these little mutations to understand how the virus is jumping from one human from the other. We call that genomic surveillance. That's when we're looking at the genome of one uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the other SARS-CoV-2 and saying, what are the differences? Okay, this one came from Japan. All right, well, we know that it came from London to Seattle and, and that's how we track how it moves because these mutations exist, but they don't really change the clinical outcome. They don't really change you know, how it enters the body for the most part. They could. 
And that's what we're trying to understand now. Are the changes that are happening so monumental that it could affect the vaccine? Are they so monumental that it could affect um, could affect the, the, the clinical representation of SARS-CoV-2 or people who have long haul symptoms after getting SARS-CoV-2. These things are things that we don't understand yet. I think a lot of people who talk about the virus need to continue to remind everyone that this research is ongoing, it's happening in live, and even us scientists don't understand it fully. So no one has definitive answers, right? We are just learning every day. We just have to be okay with saying we don't know everything yet. But here's what we do know. And just to reiterate, like, the vaccine has been used on people that have COVID with the mutated strain. It's been tried on someone. Um, as far as I know, that work is being done right now. Okay. It's very possible, though, that people who are already being vaccinated have come in contact with the new, with the, the new mutation, the new mutated version of the virus. We already know that it's in the U.S. Every day they're announcing a new state where they found it. And so... Right. It, it wouldn't be entirely surprising to me if someone has gotten vaccinated, has already had the first COVID coming in with the, this newer version of it. All of these things are possible. And also, all of these things are expected to happen. We have to remember that. These people expect these things to happen. That's why we have a new flu vaccine every day, every year, because we know that the influenza virus mutates. We try to understand the rate at which it mutates. Originally, when SARS-CoV-2 happened, we thought it mutated way slower than um, influenza. And it does, but also we have to take into consideration that now we're, we're, we're over a year now, right? Like it's, it's over a year. And even the mutations that we found do not really change so much and make as big of an impact um, as those that you would see with the influenza virus. And that's what we know right now, this could change. And I know it's like two shots the vaccine. I'm wondering, have they started to show people getting the second dose yet? I believe that people who are in the clinical trials have already gotten both doses. I would say by the end of this month and probably into next month, I can't remember, I think it's 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the, in the next couple of months, more, you know, uh, health providers will go ahead and have their second dose. But yeah. And then I feel like, you know, in the future, we're going to be heading towards vaccination cards, maybe like, have you been vaccinated yet or something like that in order to be admitted to places? You think that's possible? Yeah, I think it's possible, and I think it's something that we need to normalize. Um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is, is, is the most recent virus that has impacted us. There are going to be more viruses that come along. They're, this is going to happen again. Um, how soon it happens is, you know, something that we do have a lot of control over, but to an extent, right, and how we handle it. But it's going to happen again. And just like when we go to apply for college, we have to put in our shot records. When we try to go to a different country, you have to prove that you have gotten a malaria, you know, the malaria pills, and you have to prove that you have typhoid and all these things. This is just going to be another thing on that, on that list. Um, and so I do believe that that will happen. I do believe that there will be even more stricter guidelines on where you can and cannot go and what you can and cannot do, being vaccinated or not being vaccinated. Um, and But people need to remember, the reason why this is, is to keep everybody safe. I think one of the most sad parts about the virus that I've seen is that, for example, I had the virus. I got sick, but I mean, I didn't have to go to the hospital. A lot of people like you have come in contact with the virus, never gotten sick, but you know, even though I don't get sick, that doesn't mean that I can't give it to someone who can get a lot sicker. Doesn't right. mean that I can't go to, you know, people are going to Jamaica and going to Africa and all these places. Don't forget to lose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are going to all these places where the people who are working at these resorts, the people who are a part of the, the general public there don't have the same access to healthcare that we do. You know, some do, some don't, but like how irresponsible of it is us to bring our little COVID-19 over to their country. They just minding their business, doing their own thing. You know, we have the opportunity to get other people sick. And that's what this is. It's not just about you. It's about getting other people sick. It's about making sure your grandma doesn't get sick because your grandma coming in contact with the virus is going to be different than you coming in contact with the virus. So in conclusion, because I feel like we got all the basics out the way, we can't go too in depth. What would you say to people or specifically Black people about taking the vaccine, what would be your final word to someone who's on the fence of whether they should take it or not? Um, my final word would be that here we are with an opportunity to have an intervention that will help us from a health perspective. There has not been any evidence from this vaccine 
that it one specifically can hurt and target black people or that it's harmful to any type of person in a big impactful way. I worry that we build up and we socialize this idea of hysteria of things that don't actually exist. We miss this opportunity and we don't get vaccinated. If we don't get vaccinated, more black people die. More black people are already dying because of the fact that you know, COVID-19 is affecting people who are service workers or affecting people who have pre-existing condition, affecting all these other side effects of racism. The last thing I want is misinformation to be another side effect of racism that kills black people. Because if we don't take advantage of the medicine, we don't take advantage of the resources, we die. And if we don't die by getting COVID-19, we die because we don't have financial support because we can't go and do our jobs. If we can't go and do our jobs, then we can't pay for health care. If we can't pay for health care, then we have other pre-existing conditions. People need to understand that this is not just about SARS-CoV-2. This is bigger than that. This is the whole medical picture. This is the whole picture in terms of our financial wealth as well. You know, like this is not just about the virus. There are so many side effects of the virus that affect us. And so we need to make sure that we get vaccinated, not just for ourselves, but for the livelihood of all Black people. And anyone who is pro-Black understands the sense of community, understands that whenever we have community advantages that we need to take advantage of, we need to do them and use them to our best ability. Because as long as we're healthy and alive, that's how Black people are seen in the future. So we need to be here in the future. We need to be alive. And getting this vaccine lets us go back to work, lets us travel, lets us go out and live our greatest, greatest black lives, right? And we can't, we can't be at the march and be activists if we don't have the health, if we're not there. You know, our health is so important. And so let's all take care of our health. Let's not ignore each other when, you know, we are concerned. Let's continue to educate each other on the facts so that we are equipped with all the science and all the knowledge to make the best decisions for us. Again, <laughs> well said. <laughs> um, thank you for coming on, Dr. Jeff. Hopefully you changed minds. Hopefully you like definitely inform people who are still on the fence. So where can they find you if they have any questions or where they can just get even more information? Yes. So um, you can follow the podcast at In Those Jeans Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Yes, shirt. Yes. You could also um, join us on Thursday nights on Clubhouse. We have a cl we have a club on Clubhouse called the Bio uh, the Genomes of Black Folk. And we host a conversation every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, the past this week, we'll be specifically talking to people who have had the vaccine and their experiences. We'll also have experts on stage giving us advice. And because we believe that this information should be for everyone and not just in Clubhouse, that's invite only. We do also publish this information uh, through our podcast feed, but also on Instagram Live. So you can catch us on Instagram Live Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern or on Clubhouse. Great. And with that, please like, comment, and subscribe on the video, please. And yeah, y'all, thanks for watching. I will see y'all soon and please for the love of God if you're in Georgia vote and I mean by the time this comes out we'll know what happened so oh Lord. hopefully the people in Georgia made the right decision right anywho yeah with that thanks Janina um Dr. Jeff of course <laughs> bye y'all bye